you must have often seen a slimy green layer on rocks lying close to the sea. This green layer is algae. These are simple phthaloid chlorophyll bearing autotrophic organisms. You can spot algae growing on moist rocks and stones in marine and fresh water and on wood. Algae come in different forms and sizes. For instance, Chlamydomonas is unicellular whereas Wallvox is of colonial form and Spirogyra is filamentous. On the other hand, Kelps form massive plant bodies. Algae reproduce through vegetative, asexual and sexual methods. Vegetative reproduction occurs by the process of fragmentation, wherein each fragment develops into a thallus, while asexual reproduction takes place through spores like zoospores. These spores are flagellated and germinate into new plants. During sexual reproduction, two gametes fuse to form a new organism. Based on the size of the gametes, sexual reproduction can be further divided into isogamous, anisogamous and oogamous reproduction. When the fusion is between two gametes of similar size, the reproduction is called isogamous. The gametes in this case can be flagellated as in Chlamydomonas or non-flagellated as in Spirogyra. When fusion takes place between two gametes of dissimilar size, the reproduction is termed as anisogamous. Oogamous is a fusion between a large non-motile female gamete and a small motile male gamete. Algae perform a wide variety of functions. They carry out carbon dioxide fixation and also increase the level of dissolved oxygen in their immediate surroundings through photosynthesis. They produce energy-rich compounds that form food for aquatic organisms. Algae are also used for commercial purposes. For instance, agar obtained from gallidium and gracilaria is used to prepare ice creams and jellies. Based on the type of pigment and the type of stored food, we can classify algae into chlorophyse, pheophyse and rhodophyse. Chlamydomonas, Wolvox and Spirogyra are some members of the class chlorophyse. They are commonly called green algae and can have a unicellular, colonial or filamentous body. Their cell wall is rigid as the outer layer is made of pectose and the inner layer of cellulose. The cell has several chloroplasts that contain pyrenoids, structures that have starch and protein. In definite chloroplasts, you can find the localized pigments chlorophyll A and B that give the algae the color of green grass. Green algae can reproduce vegetatively through fragmentation and asexually by flagellated zoospores as well as sexually. Pheophyse is another class of algae and 
Ectocarpus, Dictyota, Laminaria are some of its members. These species, commonly termed as brown algae, are mostly found in brackish or salt water. They display a wide variety in form and size. For instance, Ectocarpus displays filamentous form, whereas kelps are profusely branched and can measure 100 meters in height. They also vary in color due to the varying concentrations of the pigments, xanthophils and fucoxanthin. Apart from these pigments, chlorophyll A, C and carotenoids are the other major pigments found in brown algae. Let's now take a look at the body structure and cellular structure of brown algae. The plant body consists of a frond, a leaf-like photosynthetic organ and a stipe that functions as a stalk. The frond and stipe are attached to the substratum by a holdfast. The vegetative cells of brown algae have a cellulosic wall which usually has an outer gelatinous coating of algin. The protoplast inside the cell has plastids and a centrally located vacuole and nucleus. Brown algae produce through fragmentation and asexually through biflagellate spores. On the other hand, in sexual reproduction, the gametes unite either in water or within the oogonium. Rhodophysae is another class of algae whose members include Polysophonia, Gracilaria and Gallidium. The members are often called red algae. The red color is due to a high concentration of the red pigment R. phycoerythrian. The thalli of red algae are multicellular and food is stored as Floridian starch inside the cells. Red algae are found in brackish and salt water and mostly in warmer areas. Red algae reproduce vegetatively, asexually through non-motile spores and sexually through motile spores. Thus we have seen that there are a variety of algae that thrive in the aquatic habitat. It is common to see a green cover growing over rocks, bricks and walls after heavy showers. This green cover is nothing but moss which is a type of bryophyte. Bryophytes are plants that usually grow in damp, humid and shaded localities. They are also called amphibians of the plant kingdom because though bryophytes grow in soil, they need a moist habitat for sexual reproduction. Let's now take a look at the different parts of a bryophyte. The plant body is thallus-like and is either prostrate or erect. It is attached to the substratum by unicellular or multicellular rhizoids. The plant body does not have true roots, stem or leaves but possesses similar structures. The main plant body of a bryophyte is haploid. It is also called a gametophyte as it produces gametes. The plant body has both male and female gametophytes which bear the male and female sex organs respectively. The male sex organs are called the antheridia and they produce biflagellate antherozoids. The female sex organs called the archegonia 
are flask shaped and each produces a single egg. During fertilization, the antheridium releases antherozoids in water where they come into contact with the mouth of the archegonium. One antherozoid fuses with the egg to form a zygote. The zygote in turn produces a multicellular body called the sporophyte. The sporophyte gets its nutrition from the gametophyte. Some cells of the sporophyte undergo meiosis to produce haploid spores. These spores germinate to produce a gametophyte. Bryophytes are of two types, liverworts and mosses. You can find liverworts in moist and shady environs such as barks of trees. The plant body, a thallus, is dorsiventral and oppressed to the substrate. However, in the case of leafy liverworts, the plant body bears tiny leaf-like appendages in two rows on the stem-like structures. Liverworts reproduce both asexually and sexually. In the case of asexual reproduction, we observe fragmentation of the thallus. Asexual reproduction also occurs when gemmae are formed. They are green, multicellular, asexual buds that separate from the parent and develop into new individuals. They develop in small receptacles called gemma cups located on the thallus. In the case of sexual reproduction, the male and female sex organs are produced either on the same or on different thallus. Mosses are another type of bryophytes. Funaria, Polytrichum and Sphagnum are some common species of moss. A moss undergoes several stages in life, wherein the gametophyte stage is the most predominant one. The gametophyte stage has two substages, protonema and leafy stage. In the protonema stage, the spore develops into a protonema, a thread-like chain of cells. The protonema is creeping, green, branched and filamentous. The second stage is the leafy stage, where the primary protonema develops into the secondary protonema as a lateral bud. The buds consist of upright, slender axes that bear spirally arranged leaves attached to the soil through branched rhizoids. The sexual organs develop during the leafy stage. Mosses reproduce vegetatively and sexually. Vegetative reproduction is by fragmentation and budding in the secondary protonema. In sexual reproduction, the male and female sex organs are produced at the apex of the leafy shoots. Let's now look at the uses and importance of bryophytes. Moss such as sphagnum provides peat, which is used as fuel. Moss also form a dense mat, thereby allowing rainwater to percolate into the ground. This prevents rainwater from running off and the subsequent soil erosion. Bryophytes such as moss are also ecologically important as Along with lichens, they are always the first to colonize rocks. Moreover, they decompose the rocks and make the area suitable for the growth of higher plants. Thus we have seen that bryophytes have several uses. You have probably seen ferns growing in gardens or in someone's backyard. Ferns are a type of pteridophyte.
Pteridophytes are plants that flourish in a damp, cool and shady habitat, although some species also grow in sandy soil conditions. They occupy a special place in plant evolution as they were the first terrestrial plants to possess vascular tissues. And true root, stem and leaves. The leaves of a pteridophyte are large as in ferns or small as in the case of Selaginella. Pteridophytes are widely used as ornamental plants soil binders, and for medicinal purposes. Based on the organization of the plant body, including the nature of the leaf and location of sporangia, they are classified as Coelopsida, Lycopsida, Sphenopsida, and Pteropsida. The life cycle of a pteridophyte begins when the plant body, a sporophyte, bears sporangia, which are subtended by leaf-like appendages called sporophylls. However, in some genera like Equisetum, sporophylls might form distinct and compact structures called strobili or cones. The sporangia produce spores in spore mother cells by meiosis, which germinate into gametophytes called prothallus, a small, multicellular, free-living and mainly photosynthetic gametophyte which grows only in cool, damp and shady places. The prothallus also bears the male and female sex organs, the antheridium and archegonium. The antheridium produces the male gametes called antherozoids, whereas the archegonium produces an egg. When released, antherozoids travel through water and eventually reach the mouth of the archegonium where each one fuses with an egg to form a zygote. This zygote develops into a young embryo, which further develops into a multicellular and well-differentiated young sporophyte, and ultimately into a mature sporophyte. This completes the life cycle of a pteridophyte, which is divided into the gametophytic phase and the sporophytic phase, the most dominant phase. Pteridophytes can be homosporous or heterosporous. Homosporous pteridophytes produce spores of similar kind, while heterosporous pteridophytes produce two different types of spores, large or megaspores and small or microspores. Megaspores germinate into female gametophytes, which produce eggs, while microspores germinate into male gametophytes, which produce antherozoids. The egg and antherozoid fuse to form a zygote, which develops into a young embryo, which then gives rise to a sporophyte. These pteridophytes occupy an important place in the plant kingdom as they were the first plants to have true roots, stems and leaves, as well as vascular tissues. It is common to find trees such as pinus, cedrus and cycas growing in the cooler regions of India. All of them are gymnosperms. A group of plants in which the ovules are not enclosed by an ovary wall and remain exposed or naked before fertilization as well as post-fertilization when they develop into seeds.
these seeds germinate to give rise to new plants. If you take a look at the morphology of gymnosperms, you will notice that most of them have tap roots. Moreover, in some genera, such as Pinus, the roots have a fungal association in the form of mycorrhiza, while in other genera, such as Cycas, small specialized roots called coralloid roots have an association with N2 fixing cyanobacteria. The stems of a gymnosperm can be branched or unbranched and the leaves can be compound as in cycas or simple as in ginkgo. Moreover, these leaves are well adapted to withstand extreme climatic conditions as seen in balsam fir. Its needle-like leaves reduce the surface area, which in turn reduces loss of water due to transpiration. Even the thick cuticle and sunken stomata on the leaves reduce the rate of water loss. The reproductive structure of a gymnosperm is called a strobilus or a cone. And gymnosperms have both male and female strobili. Interestingly, the strobili may be born on the same tree as seen in Pinus or on different trees as seen in Cycas. The male strobilus has spirally arranged leaf-like structures called microsporophylls, which bear microsporangia, a structure that produces haploid microspores. A few microspores develop into male gametes called pollen grains and the rest degenerate. Another name for male strobili is microsporangia. The female strobilus is a cluster of megasporophylls which bears ovules containing the megasporangium or nucellus. The megasporangium, surrounded by a layer of envelopes, produces haploid megaspores and a megaspore mother cell which looks distinctly different from the other megaspores. The megaspore mother cell undergoes meiosis to give rise to four haploid megaspores. One of these spores develops into a multicellular female gametophyte. The female gametophyte further bears two or three female sex organs called archegonia, which develop inside the ovule. The development of archegonia is followed by the fertilization process, during which pollen grains released from the microsporangium are carried by air currents and come in contact with the micropyle, an opening in the ovules. A pollen tube sprouts from the pollen grain and grows towards the archegonium, where it discharges the male gametes. These gametes fuse with the egg to form a zygote. Post-fertilization, the zygote develops into an embryo and the ovule into a seed. Interestingly, gymnosperms were the first plants to have a seed habit. Today, gymnosperms are widely used to make products such as varnish and cosmetics. They also provide us with lumber that's used to make furniture. You must have come across banana plantations, apple orchards, or herbs such as basil. You may have also seen flowers such as lotus and roses growing in ponds and gardens. All these are species of flowering plants, also called angiosperms. These are plants in which the ovules develop inside the flowers. The seeds too are enclosed in fruits. And they can be monocotyledonous or dicotyledonous. A typical flower of an angiosperm contains the stamen and the pistil.
the male and female sex organs respectively. The stamen consists of two parts, filament and anther. The microsporangia inside the anther contain the microspore mother cells. These mother cells undergo meiosis to produce microspores, which then develop into pollen grains, the male gametophytes. The pollen grains are produced inside the anther. On the other hand, the pistil consists of the stigma at the tip, followed by the style in the middle and an ovary at the base. The ovules or the megasporangia are present inside the ovary. These ovules contain the megaspore mother cell, which following meiosis develops into the haploid female gametophyte called the embryo sac. The embryo sac has a three-celled egg apparatus consisting of one egg cell, two synergids, three antipodal cells and two polar nuclei. The polar nuclei eventually fuse to produce a diploid secondary nucleus. The embryo sac now becomes ready for fertilization, which in the case of angiosperms, takes place by a process called pollination. During pollination, the anther disperses the pollen grains, which are then carried by agents such as the wind and insects, and are deposited over the stigma of a pistol. Here, the pollen grain germinates and produces a pollen tube. This tube penetrates the tissues of the stigma and style to enter the embryo sac inside the ovule. It discharges two male gametes inside the embryo sac. While one gamete fuses with the egg cell to produce a zygote, the other gamete fuses with the diploid secondary nucleus to produce the triploid primary endosperm nucleus. This event is called double fertilization as it involves two fusions. Interestingly, Double fertilization is observed only in angiosperms. After fertilization, the synergids and antipodals degenerate. On the other hand, the zygote develops into an embryo and the primary endosperm nucleus develops into an endosperm, which nourishes the zygote. Simultaneously, the ovule develops into a seed and the ovary into a fruit. The seed germinates and the embryo develops into a new plant. Angiosperms are one of the biggest plant groups and they grow in diverse habitats such as land and water as well as in different climatic conditions. Besides being a source of food, they supply us with fuel, fodder and medicines. Thus, Angiosperms form an integral part of the ecosystem as well as of our daily lives. If you observe the life cycle of any sexually reproducing plant, you will notice that it alternates between a sporophytic generation and a gametophytic generation. This is termed as alternation of generations. In the life cycle of the fern, for instance, the main plant body, a mature sporophyte, bears sporangia, which produce haploid spores through meiosis. These spores undergo mitosis and germinate into a prothallus, a gametophyte with haploid cells. The prothallus bears the antheridium and archegonium that respectively produce antherozoids and egg, the haploid male and female gametes. The fusion of these haploid gametes results in the formation of a diploid zygote, which undergoes mitosis to reproduce a diploid young sporophyte. The young sporophyte soon matures into an adult sporophyte, completing the life cycle.
The plant body thus alternates between a sporophytic generation and a gametophytic generation. However, in different plant groups, either the sporophytic generation or the gametophytic generation is the dominant phase, or in other words, persists for a longer period. This difference gives rise to three patterns of life cycle in plants. The haplontic life cycle, diplontic life cycle, and haplodiplontic life cycle. In the haplontic life cycle, observed in algae such as Chlamydomonas, Spirogyra, and Wolvox, the sporophytic generation is represented by a single-celled diploid zygote and there are no free living sporophytes. This zygote undergoes meiosis to form haploid spores which divide mitotically to produce a free living gametophyte. Since mitosis occurs only in the haploid phase, the resulting gametophytes are also called haplons and the life cycle is called the haplontic life cycle, wherein the gametophytic generation is the dominant phase. In the diplontic life cycle, observed in gymnosperms and angiosperms, the gametophytic generation is represented by a single or a few-celled gametophyte. On the other hand, the dominant sporophytic generation is represented by a diploid, free-living and photosynthetic sporophyte. In the haplodiplontic life cycle, observed in bryophytes and pteridophytes, both sporophytic and gametophytic generations are multicellular and free-living. However, the dominant phases are different in the life cycle of bryophytes and pteridophytes. In bryophytes, for instance, a free-living thalloid photosynthetic and erect haploid gametophyte represents the dominant phase. On the other hand, the sporophytic generation is short-lived, during which the multicellular sporophyte is totally or partially dependent on the gametophyte for its anchorage and nutrition. In pteridophytes, the photosynthetic sporophyte with vascular tissues is the dominant phase that alternates with the haploid, independent, multicellular, saprophytic or autotrophic gametophyte. Apart from bryophytes and pteridophytes, certain algae such as Ectocarpus and Polysiphonia also exhibit the haplodiplontic life cycle. Thus, every plant cycle is marked by alternation of the sporophytic with the gametophytic phase. However, the dominant phase differs in different plant groups.